So let's go to the Lord. Take a moment if necessary. <clears throat> Confess any sin that you need. And uh, we'll begin. Well, Father, we're thankful for Jesus Christ. This, the focus of everything, the focus of the universe, the logos, the, the uh, unifying principle of creation and that holds all things together. It's all embodied in, in, in a person in the God-man. And so we are here to discuss his birth, as the scripture report, and, and, uh, and his parents, the, his earthly parents, his mother, and, and the man that you appointed as a steward to be an example for the humanity of Christ. I can't imagine being called upon to be the example for the humanity of Christ. What a man that must have been. He, he, he shows himself a very stable, giving, loving, sacrificial man, making an example that Jesus followed as well. Pray that you'd give us an insight into what it means to be a man and, and a woman, a believer, a humble believer who is willing to do the will of God. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Jack London, I got this from... Uh, I think I got it from Andy Stanley this morning. The proper function of a man is to live, not just exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong my days. I shall use my time. In other words, I'll use my time to do something important, not just to live. I want to use my time as, as an example of Christ for my loved ones to see. I personally will want to go past just understanding and even using God's Word for my life. I want to be transformed into an image that is an example of Him, for my character to be like His character, for my beliefs and heart and feelings and thoughts and expressions to be like His, to edify in that way. So, imagine the kind of man... Joseph was for God the Father to consider him when choosing an earthly father for his son. Clearly and obviously, he would choose someone who would set a superior example for the humanity of Jesus. He would need to be humble and teachable, spiritually hungry, obedient to the Scriptures, and in tune with the voice of God. He would need to know that his human strength was wholly inadequate, and willing to learn deeper and deeper levels of dependence on the Spirit. And he would have to be a sacrificial person, a servant, with the capacity to put Mary and, Je and Jesus above any need or want of his own. That's the kind of guy he was. Now listen, nobody starts off like that. You develop that through spiritual growth. If it's real, now you can simulate that with, with personality, and, and legalism, but you can't be the genuine article. You can't have the spirit, in, you know, empower your character to have these very thoughts and feelings and expressions like this guy without spiritual growth, without the, the, the spirit life being your priority. Now, what does it mean to be an example? Because that's what my encouragement for, for myself and for us is this year. There's several words in the Bible, the, uh, uh, the, the Greek words and Hebrew words, but it's a model, a pattern, an image to follow and emulate. Uh, often the word for example is the word for uh, like a, the striking a coin. If you take a coin and look at the head on it, that image is the pattern. And so the Bible's full of this. For instance, all the kings of Israel are compared with the example of David. Jehoshaphat followed the example of David. Many did not. John 13, Jesus gives an example, the foot washing, and that amazed everyone. And this is the servant, the serving one another. What was it he said if you wanted to be great? How do you become great? You serve everybody. You become the servant of all. 
So, all these examples, there was many more. 1 Corinthians 10 and Hebrews 4.11 were, had to be a bad example. Have an evil heart of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 says the tabernacle and the temple were images of heaven. The, the temple in heaven. That's why God was so clear about the measurements. Finally, Philippians 3, you know, you see follow, follow Paul's example and mark those who live differently. And the one that, that I see as an example is Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. It says, but God, it talks about one through three, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Then it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. He raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, literally in him, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, in verse 7, he gives us the purpose. He gives you a hina clause. So that in the ages to come, he might show. And that word show means to, make, to teach something using a visual aid. The visual aid. That he might show the surpassing riches of his grace by his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. During the future ages, God will be using us as visual aids. You're a visual aid. You're an example. Of His grace. <laughs> this is a great way to be, you know, to use someone as an example by being kind to them. God is making us a visual aid of His grace by being kind to us. His kindness toward you is a visual aid of His desire to be kind to everyone. His desire to show love to everyone, his desire to save everyone, and to have a relationship with everyone is you're an example of God's grace, and you'll be that forever. So we're all visual aids to those around us, influencing them for God or for their own independence. I've come to believe that God allows adversity because this is the devil's world that we're in and he's allowed the adversity. And we either as believers respond by being humbled and we learn and we grow and we develop or we become bitter. Those are the two options. You just hang on to your selfishness. Uh, you hang on to your expectations and demands of other people. You must serve me <clears throat> the way that I want you to serve me. And if you don't, I'm going to be angry with you and I'm going to try to manipulate you. I'm going to try to make you change to be more of what I want you to be. And if you don't, and you can't, see, <laughs> nobody can do that. And so you get bitter. You get bitter and you get disappointed and you get disillusioned. If you're not careful, you go into despair and, and depression because you can't make life work on your terms. So if that's what you're showing to your mate, to your children or grandchildren, this selfish demand, expectation, that's your example. If that rules your life still, then that's your example. That's what you're showing. That's what you're a visual aid of. So, is that what you want to be a visual aid of? Say no. Right? No. The other side is the humble side. It's the surrender side. It's the giving up to God side. It's, listen, it's not the grit your teeth and be strong side. It's not it at all. It's the surrender to God side. It's the being remade in God's image side. It's about believing like Christ believes. So, we're visual aids either surrendering to God and letting the adversities of your life be a tool for your growth, for you to glorify Him. See, that's what it's for. That's what Romans 8, 28. All things work together. God works all things together for divine good to those that love Him. That means those who are committed to 
his plan, committed to walking with him. When you're committed to walking with him instead of being independent and, and implementing your own plan. See, Joseph was going to implement his plan. He's like, Mary, I love you. I think you're great, but I don't want to marry somebody who's been unfaithful. I mean, I don't want to marry somebody I don't trust. He was not a wimp. No. Is that me making that noise? It is, isn't it? All right. Well, I'm following my Chris's example here, so I'm going to do that. It is. A, it is. I know. It's an example of a work in progress, just like me. I am definitely, see, why am I teaching this? Of course, I teach this all the time, but this is, this is what I'm being taught. That's what I'm being taught. How, how am I, what example am I setting for my wife and for my kids and for my congregation and for my fellow believers and for this community? Let me tell you something about this community. We, Rhonda and I, we probably know more than anybody about, because we're the counselors. That lady there is a counselor. I know I'm supposed to be the counselor, but she's the, she counsels me. But, but anyway, the people in this community are, the, they, they, they're mostly just abandoned kids. They're mostly just abandoned kids. And they're trying to get their hearts filled up by attaching to people. They, they've been left with this hole in them because their parents were drug addicts and they left them and they've got this emptiness in them that, that's in everybody that has to attach to God that we always attach to people. But these people are walking around empty and they're trying to get what they want and need from the people in their life, which is not possible. And so they're so hurt and disillusioned and they, they, they need us. Listen, listen, let me tell you this congregation. This is just my opinion. They need, they need people to be examples of love and mercy and, and stability and somebody who's going to be there for them and somebody, not somebody has all the answers, not somebody spiffy and shiny, somebody who's real, who's a work in progress themselves, who's just honest and real and is willing to let them in and be there for them. And nurture them along. So, there's a mission. There's a ministry. Is that me? Is that you? Is, can I be an example of somebody who just is moving toward the Lord? Who's trying to surrender my life to the Lord, to be good to my family, to be a lover, to be one filled with mercy and no judgment? That's what we need. That's what's going to put people on this path moving toward the Lord. Then, of course, we got the Word of God. But the old saying, people don't care what you know until they know how much you care. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. There's just a lot of truth in that. Now, the, this Christmas, continue, let's look, continue to allow the Lord to reveal our selfish expectations that we place on others so that you, you can reject that as a way of relating to your loved ones is a selfish expectation. And and ask the Lord to make you an example of love and mercy. This is what Joseph, as I look at Joseph, this is the, the example he set for me. I mean, he felt betrayed. Very much so. I mean, they're, listen, they're legally married. She can't go outside of that without, he could have her stoned to death in the public square. He can have her disgraced. If there was a bit of resentment or anger in his heart toward her, you would have seen it. But there wasn't. His is a man that, that, that's a forgiving. He forgave her. Of course, he's, he doesn't have all the information yet. When he gets all the information, boom, he's in with the program. But he doesn't have it yet. And he's jumping the gun, <laughs> no doubt. You know, she comes in showing and he's like, tell me that again. Tell me that again. The Holy Spirit. So, anyway. Well, 
I guess, I guess, you know, when the angel came, the angel had credibility. So apparently Mary didn't. Uh, all right, so first of all, let's look at this. Joseph, as a mature believer, had discerned God's true message, message of love and mercy rather than judgment. This was a day of, of ritual and judgment. This was an apostate group of people, Judah, Judea in the first century. Joseph, who was a righteous man, this is experientially, not desiring to disgrace her, had planned to divorce her secretly. The letter of the law said expose her publicly, but, the, but he knew that the Lord desires mercy. Jesus told the Pharisees, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion or mercy and not sacrifice. I did not call, come to call the righteous but sinners. Joseph had discerned through even the legalistic teaching of the day in which he lived, he had discerned, apparently through the Holy Spirit, the real message was love the Lord and love your neighbor and be merciful. He understood this. He looked past the legalistic letter into the heart of the matter. This was the kind of guy he was. He looked past just the doctrine into the meaning and the application and how does this work? How do I make this work in my life? What kind of person does God want me to be? So, his, de he, his decision to divorce, first of all, shows he was not interested in, in being used by an unfaithful woman or unfaithful person. You know, as, as we are talking to different people, we find that there's so much selfish expectation because there's so much need that one person is dominating the other person to get their way. This happens in relationships. One will be stronger than the other always. Uh, and so you have this competition, this combat, this pulling against each other. And, and Joseph, had, had he been so needy for Mary, he could have just given in and gone along with it. But he said no. He was, he was intact. His soul was intact. I don't know if that makes sense for you to you, but wisdom told him that even love for Mary couldn't overcome this idea that she had committed adultery. That's what the Bible tells you. That's the only reason you get to get out of your marriage. If your partner commits adultery, then you're free to go. And so he understood that even though he loved Mary, this was not going to, he was not going to be, that was not going to overcome this idea that she'd been unfaithful. He wasn't going to go there. This was strength. Now he was wrong in his thinking. He had, he had, he had as Patty said, he had the information. He just wasn't put it, putting it together yet. Later when he entered into this, he became the support for Mary and for God's son by conscious, intentional choice. Listen, what I'm saying, he was faithful to the Lord. You know why he did this? He obeyed the Lord. It wasn't just because he loved Mary. He definitely loved Mary. But he, he obeyed the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something about your relationships. The reason that will make your relationships work better is if you do what you're supposed to do for the Lord. If you do it because you're trying to please the other person. It's never going to be enough. It's never going to be the right amount. It's never going to be the right thing. Do what you're supposed to do. Lead, submit, love, respect for the Lord. Joseph's doing this for the Lord. And that puts it all in perspective. That puts, puts everybody where they're supposed to be. God's first. Everybody else is next. And listen. <laughs> Though that's hard one wisdom right there. That's hard one, right? That's hard one wisdom. That's wisdom. Joseph's mature status gave him 
the capacity for unconditional love and mercy even for an unfaithful wife. In an evil generation in which we're in now, he was an example of spiritual hunger and discernment of the Spirit. And he saw beyond the hypocrisy of the Jews who had turned the rituals of the law into a work system. There are many people today, many churches, churches that have taken the Christian doctrines of grace and turned them into a, a works deal where you're, you're, you use your human ability to try to be this kind of person to do these types of things. And the Christian life is about allowing God to remake you from the inside out into the image of Christ. It's not about getting a new list of do's and don'ts and using your human will and human effort to do the do's and don't the don'ts to make yourself look like a Christian in front of other people. Not it at all. But that's what... When you're not pursuing the Lord, that's what your Christian life devolves into. Just doing what you're supposed to do. Your prayer life stops. There's no real interaction between you and God. There's no real inner peace. No supernatural stuff going on. No prayers that are answered. You just are be, you've devolved into being a moral person who goes through the motions. That's not, what, that's not what's going on here. So... We don't want to, if, if you're there, easy to get there. Been there many times. I've got a condo there in that place where you just start to go through the motions. Listen, close the condo and come back. Has your Christian faith devolved into going through the motions of Bible class, yet you've stopped allowing the Spirit to challenge you to go deeper into deeper levels of purification in your heart? Let's open our hearts to enter into the life of possessing the divine nature and developing the heart of Christ. This Christmas, let's get the spiritual juices flowing. Let's do some praying. Let's do some asking. Let's ask God to give us people that we can lead to the Lord, that we can be a witness to, that we can be an example to. Let's use this holiday with our family and our, our loved ones is to be an example of love and mercy, like Joseph. So, Paul said in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So Joseph did far more than show up for Bible class and take notes. He applied the truths to his own person and character, directing his needs to the Lord first and then giving himself to the Lord and his family. Secondly, his humility made him teachable and willing to change his beliefs when it was appropriate. Ron, Ron developed that exactly right the first half as far as the language because after he had considered this, verse 20, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David. Notice he gives him that title, son of David. Very important. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who's been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. In verse 23, uh, anyway, after considering, and this word is an heiress passive participle, it means after he had finished considering, he had thought it through, he had come to his conclusion. She cheated on me. You know, I've heard the explanation, but I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It doesn't make sense. It says, after considering, Aris part of simple, after he had finished considering, he decided. Now your Bible might say he desired to put her away quietly. That's not it. Bulamai uh, is a word to create a plan. It's the, in Acts 2.23, it's the predetermined plan of God for your life. It's a plan. He had, he had reached his conclusion and he had a plan. Okay, he had a plan. So, he was no longer fact-gathering or deliberating about Mary. He had made up his mind. Yet, when the angel gave Joseph the report, there is no indication that he hesitated. He immediately changed his mind about Mary, and more importantly, about God's will. 
And it says, after he woke up, he immediately did as the angel commanded. I mean, that's an obedient soul. I don't know that I'm an obedient soul. I, I'm, I'm a, sometimes I want to be more obedient, but this guy really is obedient. Joseph was an effective steward of God's son because of his willingness to listen, learn, and obey. Listen, who, who has God given you in your life? You're a steward of your mate, of your children, of your grandchildren, of your neighbor. You are a steward of your example and witness. You are a steward of that. Do you know what that means? I mean, God has given this to you for you to manage, for you to handle it properly, for you to be an example to those people that are connected to you of Him, of Him. So, here, if, if, we, if you were to write your own report card, how are you doing with that? You say, well, I'm making my living, I get my chores done. Well, how about the love? How about the forgiveness? How about the inner peace? How about the relaxed attitude that allows others to fail, to be irritated, to be to have a tone of voice with you and you don't react. How about that? How about having decided that everything you say and do is going to build them up and edify them? Or are you still demanding from them? Give me, give me, give me what I, what I married you for. Or children, what I had you for. Give me. And if they don't or they can't, then you're angry and bitter. Merry Christmas. Are you getting yourself out of the way? So thirdly, Joseph's humility enabled him to realize that he was helpless and dependent on God's power. He gave her mercy. He gave her unconditional love. He gave her forgiveness. He didn't want to harm her. He didn't want to hurt her. But he didn't, want, he didn't want to marry somebody unfaithful. And he believed that she was. As soon as he realized that she wasn't, and look, it was more than that. God wanted him to do this. God chose him to be the steward of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through his early days. And he chose this man to be his example. And Joseph entered into that and embraced that and gave it all that was in him to be that person. So, his humility enabled him to realize that he was helpless and dependent on God's power to protect Jesus from the schemes of the devil to destroy him. Now, I've compared him with Paul about this whole Think about weakness and strength. When, when, when man is weak, God is strong. Huh. Joseph was barely mentioned in the Bible. It, but he appears to be relatively free from ego and or demanding life on his own terms. You don't see any of that. Of course, we don't see much about him, but he just, once he heard the will of God, boom, he was in it. Once he saw that Mary and Jesus were God's will for him, he fully embraced that life. But listen, he couldn't make the right decision without a series of teaching angels telling him what to do. He, this guy didn't pretend to be smart and know what, you know. Listen, he didn't tell Mary, I've got the plan. You've got to listen to me. I'm the authority in this relationship, and you're going to listen to me. He didn't, listen, he didn't know what to do. Who would have known what to do? Why do you, listen, why do you think you know what to do? Why are you so smart that everybody should listen to you? You're not. The Lord is, though. Watch what the Lord does here. He gives Joseph what he needs. He couldn't make the right decision without these teaching angels. God provided the circumstances that forced him on the road 
Look, Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. And God had to provide, had to move Rome, the Roman government, to call for a census to get them on the road. Forced them. Now, what circumstances are going on in your life that you are complaining about, that you think is an imposition, that you say we can't afford, that you are struggling with, that God has allowed just for your perfect, His perfect plan for you? What are you fussing with him about? I'm sure Joseph and Mary wanted to fuss with the Lord about having to be on the road with his, she's about to pop. I mean, she, as one who's carried many, many a diaper bag, I mean, they had a mule just dedicated for the diaper bag. How about this? God closed all the inns, all the motels, why? So that the Lamb of God would be born in a barn and have temple shepherds attend Him. Why was Jesus born in a barn? He's the Lamb of God. Why did shepherds come? He was the, he was the Lamb of God to be sacrificed. God provided the wise men to finance their escape to Egypt when Herod wanted to kill Him. Joseph wasn't wise enough, strong enough, spiritually aware enough to do any of that by himself. He was a mature and growing believer with capacity for sacrificial love, and he allowed God to direct him. I would encourage that for all of us. That's what I want to be. I don't want to be smart. I want to know it all. I don't know it all. I don't know much. I know a little bit about certain things, but I just need, I just need to be sensitive and listen and let the Lord direct me. I, and knowing that every step that I take, he's made provision for it. He's made provision. Listen, if you want to know, if you want to see God's provision for his people, talk to that guy right there. Talk to that guy right there. He'll tell you some stories. He's just now starting with the stories. All right. Finally, Joseph was a servant, and it, it, he put Mary and the baby ahead of himself. We don't realize how many people are actually watching us and comparing our actions with our words. Do you, you don't realize. Did you know that angels are watching you? God is using angels. I mean, God is using you and I to teach angels. Part of the angelic conflict. And... He's using you and I as examples of the people around us. We're going to have hundreds of young people come into this congregation. It's, we're just getting ready for it. They're going to come in and they're going to need people that are going to be kind to them and love them and be gracious to them. And not, not, not try to jump deep into the Word with them at first, but just to love them. Just to say, you're welcome here. We're going we're gonna to help you. We're going to take care of you. We're going to share our life with you. We're going to give you what we have. So that's the mindset I'm trying to take into this Christmas year with the family that's coming over. They are coming over, aren't they, Rhonda? Yeah, so anyway, let's go to the Lord. I thank you for allowing me to share these things with you. I think they're important. It's amazing to me that Ron and I saw the same message. His was a little more in-depth than mine, but it was just about, he's talked about your witness, and I saw an example. All right, Father, what a great privilege to be challenged, to, to be revealed to us that we're examples, that, that we're examples of real people trying to walk toward the Lord, toward you. Definitely not perfect. You know, stumbling in the Spirit, walking as best we can, Father, growing and developing. I swear, Father, that these things are the essence of life, and I know they are. And I just praise you for all that, Father, and for including us in it and letting us be part of your plan. And I just thank you, and I, I just pray this Christmas season, Father, that we could see ourselves in this positive light as these those loved by God, those wanted and desired and, and kept and 
preserved forever. Help us to not expect so much from each other and to give each other the slack that we all need that you give us. We love you, Father. We praise you now in Christ's name. Amen.